So what I will do in the next 45 minutes is take a research view on data center technologies, and that's important to emphasize. I'm not part of the Microsoft Azure product group, but I'm part of Microsoft research. So, so there we take a longer term view on technological development, uh, development, so three to five years or even longer on the time horizon. So just keep that in mind, because what I'm presenting is, has nothing to do with product roadmap, although I will talk about Azure as well. And I will indeed start uh, with a quote by our Azure CTO, Mark Rosinovich, um, that says, the fundamental disruption that the cloud is creating is based on instant access to compute and infinite storage. So instant access to compute and infinite storage, which is, of course, sort of a great vision statement, especially for the HPC community. But that's sort of the, the goalpost. That's what, ideally, we want to achieve with the cloud. But what I will show you in the next 45 minutes is that with current cloud technologies, we are approaching a wall. So why is that? Well, current cloud technologies were conceived before the cloud existed, and they have evolved a lot, and they are still evolving a lot, but they are still hindered by their legacy design. So at MSR in Cambridge, we're taking a new approach. Um, in the, in uh, our research team, we are looking at new technologies for the cloud that exploit optics. And today, I will I will motivate why we use optics and then talk about our work in optical networking and optical storage. But as we start, let's have a look at uh, Microsoft Azure today. So uh, today the infrastructure looks like that. We deploy data centers in more than 50 regions around the world. Each of these data centers has in the order of 10 to 20, uh, each of these regions has in the order of 10 to 20 data centers and each data center has in the order of 100,000 servers. All this is connected by 10,000s of kilometers of fiber. So it's a vast infrastructure indeed, uh, and keep in mind that has grown uh, enormously. So in the last four to five years, the growth factor has been about 10x. So that is about sort of doubling up every year. And just to give you an example here, so this is a data center that just a few years ago was sort of cutting edge and, uh, and doing everything to meet customer demands. And this is a wider image where you see the extension taking place and this data center being, um, being extended to sort of cover a, uh, a two mile end to end um, region. So massive growth really, if you can imagine um, our uh, colleagues in, the, in uh, Microsoft Azure who maintain an infrastructure like this and who basically double up every year. Um, of course, we have an HPC offering. I will not talk about this today, but you are probably aware. I've just uh, been given a couple of slides um, by our HPC colleagues, and there have been some recent announcements, or some, uh, some new um, HPC offerings that we have in the company um, that really deliver great performance for HPC workloads. And I have this... Um, this overview slides where you show the new virtual machines in the HB and HC uh, series that really are um, for today and, and for the immediate future, of course, do everything that you need in HPC, um, for HPC workloads. But that's not the topic of today. I will, as, as I said, take a research view and developments. And there I want to look back and kind of see how does... Uh, um, Azure grow, how can it meet this sort of increase in demand? So how do we scale cloud capacity? Well, of course, we have to sort of improve the infrastructure on all levels. That means faster and faster servers, more processing power, more accelerators such as FPGAs and GPUs, and more memory. But we also have to build faster and faster networks. And so in order to meet the sort of 10x in four to five years or doubling up uh, every year um, growth in the cloud infrastructure. And as if this was not, not enough, um, there's actually a phenomenon that is summarized here in a slide by Mark Rosinovich that talks about um, overall data generation. So uh, the amount of data generated by all of mankind is doubling every other year. So let that sink in. We have exponential growth in, in data, and that's overall um, data since uh, mankind, um, start of mankind. So uh, that is, of course, um, massive. And where does this data come from? Well, you and HPC know uh, more about this. I know an uh, electron microscope, for example, producing terabytes of data every day. 
um, but then you have Internet of Things with all this edge data coming in, sensor data coming in from the edge. You have, uh, um, of course, your consumer data, and you have machine learning and AI workloads driving this uh, further. So, but how big is a zettabyte? It's sort of kind of quite difficult to get the notion um, of this. So that's a hard disk, a 10, 10 terabyte capacity, which is sort of cutting edge today. And you would need 100 million of those to get to one zettabyte. So if you stack those up in a, in a sort of tower, that would be two and a half thousand kilometers high. And if you wanted to transmit that sort of data across a um, high end data center network link today, that would take you two and a half thousand years. So our colleagues in Azure are actually talking about the data tsunami. And of course, for them, it's sort of, um, you know, this is coming and, and it's sort of, they're working to meet up today and tomorrow and next year. Uh, but, but it's sort of the, the, the growth is frightening. So really, with this exponential growth in data, um, we need, uh, respectively, we need the exponential growth around storage, but of course also uh, compute and networking. Um, and Microsoft has done a lot to uh, build up the, the cloud infrastructure accordingly, as I said, by pushing existing technologies to the brink, but also by making considerable investments in custom hardware. So I have a few examples here of custom hardware that uh, Microsoft has, has built. So, for example, um, as regards compute, we are building our own REC servers and contributing these designs to the Open Compute project in Project Olympus. Regarding storage, we're designing our own custom storage racks for cold uh, storage, so that's uh, a sort of infrequently accessed data, um, in Project Pelican. And just to say that Project Pelican is a project that started almost 10 years ago at the, in Microsoft Research Cambridge and that was built up to a level of maturity where it could be transferred into Azure and is now running at scale uh, in Azure data centers. So that was a great success for the Cambridge uh, team to uh, build up their research to something that can really pro be productized. And regarding networking, in Project Medicine, we are designing our own fiber transmission technology to achieve multi-terabit speeds between data centers. And finally, also regarding networking, we are laying down our own subsea cables between continents uh, in order to provide higher bandwidth and lower latency. So a lot has been achieved, a very vast infrastructure um, indeed, and that enabled us to sort of grow across these three dimensions. And please keep these in mind because I'll be looking back at, back at compute storage and networking later on. But I also said it's challenging. We have the data tsunami. Uh, we're in the middle of this already, of course. Uh, and there is more disruption on the horizon. Um, and many of you will kind of know what I'm talking about. It's the end of Moore's law. So the, the, the limitations I have uh, with CMOS scaling, they are, of course, on the horizon as well. And what might be less well known is that I have uh, the end of Moore's law in compute, so there's sort of, um, Moore's law, of course, saying that every other year I get processors that are twice as fast, but basically at the uh, flat cost factor. So what's less well known is that I have similar phenomena in storage and networking. There's also similar phenomena to, uh, to the end of Moore's law, and we don't know exactly when this will take place, but it's inevitable that it will because of the limitations of CMOS scaling. So all this um, transistor-based technology kind of reaching the limit of, of what can be achieved. So what we know is that we need new growth curves, right? We need new technologies that give us, uh, gives us these exponential growth because we need this because of the data tsunami. And that, of course, for a, an organization like Microsoft Research, where we have the luxury to stand back and say three to five years or even longer on the time horizon, what might these technologies be that uh, give us this growth? That's, that's the kind of position we are in at MSR. And so we started a few years ago, probably four or five years ago, looking at the properties that these data centers need to fulfill, or these, and new, these new technologies need to fulfill in order to meet this uh, growth, uh, growth demand, and then looking at different options, evaluating those, and we in the Cambridge lab settled on optics. 
there are other parts of the company where other technologies um, are uh, investigated. You might have heard about uh, the DNA storage work, so we have a team working on this. We have teams that work on accelerator technology, etc. So there is quite a lot uh, going on, because of course you can't just uh, go into one direction and hope that it will work out, but in order to overcome these, um, these up this upcoming disruption, um, you have to of course look at all, the, uh, all different possibilities. Right, so that uh, brings me to uh, the topic of the talk, the optics, but let's just uh, briefly summarize. Um, so what I basically said is that um, Microsoft Azure, the Microsoft Cloud, is an impressive infrastructure. It has grown massively over the years, um, but it is facing the two main um, uh, challenges, the data tsunami, the doubling of data every other year, and the end of Moore's law across compute, storage, and networking. So we settled on optics, and why is that? Well, there have been impressive advances in optical technologies in the 21st century. Just be aware that since 2005, we had four physics Nobel Prizes being awarded in the space of optics. So there have been breakthrough innovations in academic labs across the world that are relevant here. And so we started about four or five years ago, we started on sort of individual project collaborations with optic la optics labs around the world. So at the moment, this is just a, um, a, a number of the universities we are working with currently on projects that bring the phys physics side together with what's needed for the data center to explore sort of different aspects of bringing optical technologies into the cloud. And we found we have formed the Optics for the Cloud Research Alliance. So what's so special about this? Well, if you kind of look at this picture, we are now working with, uh, in the optic space, so that's really part of physics. Uh, but in order to do this work, we need to take a very cross-disciplinary approach. So we need, of course, competence in hardware, storage, and networking, and really have to build very cross-disciplinary teams of people. And that's probably easier in, in an organization like Microsoft Research than in university, because you can just um, build up the teams, depending on, on funding, of course, but. Uh, whatever you require. So we have physicists now in-house, we have, um, of course, computer scientists working on networking, storage te uh, technologies, engineers, hardware people, etc. So very cross-disciplinary team of people looking at this from an end-to-end -end point of view. And we can do this because we own and operate the entire cloud stack. So for example, on the physical level, um, we develop our own um, uh, photonic integrated circuits, so-called PICs, uh, in the lab and have them fabricated externally. And then later on I will talk about um, uh, this, our storage work and also about our work in networking that will be up next. Okay, so let's look at optical networking for the cloud. So in this section, the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, I will show you that by using light and glass, we can achieve high bandwidth and ultra low latency in the data center. And I will show you how a fast tunable laser that we have designed in the Cambridge lab can fundamentally change the way in which we design networks and applications. So how does data center networking work today? So as mentioned earlier, a typical data center has in the order of 100,000 servers across a few thousand racks. Um, and on, so each rack has so many, many servers. And on the top of each rack, you have an electrical switch. And this is then connected in, an, in a hierarchy of electrical switches so that every rack and the data center can talk to every other rack. So that's what an electrical switch uh, looks like, and it uses so-called pluggable transceivers um, that take optical signals and uh, convert them into electrical, uh, into the electrical domain, so into zeros and ones. And why is that? Because everything that is transmitted over two meters or more needs to be uh, sent in the optical domain because uh, electrical would uh, not be possible due to signal degradation. So we have to use optics anyway for, uh, for anything that is two meters or longer. So that means in a hierarchy like this, um, we need to really, sorry, pointer is, 
this one? Yeah. In a hierarchy like this, um, we need to send the electrical signal, then convert it to optical, then send it the next level up, um, convert it back to electrical, then back to optical, send it further, etc. cetera. Um, so what happens is that uh, you convert the, tech, uh, the um, package into, into the electrical domain, and then in your switch, you have a little microprocessor that does an address lookup, so it kind of needs to find out where the packet has to go next, which hop it has to go next. It then queues the packet at the respective output port, and then my pluggable transceiver converts it back into optical and sends it, uh, and sends it on. So it's quite complicated because depending on which racks you send your packet to and from, um, you can have up to five conversions or so between optical, electrical, back and forth. So that is, of course, quite an overhead, and that's what's happening in the data center, but that's also the technology that's used in the internet. And why, I mean, that, that does look fairly complicated, so why have we settled on this? Um, why have we been okay? Well, because we, Moore's law of, uh, for networking was, uh, is valid um, still, and what this means is basically we get, uh, we, get, we get new switch technology every other year, that gives us the increase in performance while keeping a flat cost factor. So we kind of more or less get this gross, exponential growth automatically with a techno uh, technological advance of CMOS technologies. So flat cost factor, which is great because our um, colleagues in, in Microsoft Azure don't have to give it that much thought today because they know new switch chips are coming um, very soon and give them the growth that they need to kind of um, uh, to, to manage the workloads that the customer um, delivers. Okay, so I mentioned this beforehand, of course, so we have this, the electrical switching, exponential growth, but it is tailing off, um, and this means, uh, the tailing off means that we might have new CMOS technologies giving us electrical switches, but they might be more expensive and more expensive with every generation that is coming. So every two, three years when we change the equipment in the data center, we have to pay more, which would give us, uh, gives us an exponential growth in cost factor as well, which of course will not be very popular with the customer. So we instead are looking at optical switching to overcome these limitations. So why optics? Well, we, all, we know that we already use optics in the data center with all these conversions uh, for the transmissions across the, uh, our fibers. So um, if you kind of think back, we had this fairly complicated hierarchy of electrical switches, and the idea would be to kind of try to find some, some optical switch instead. And another reason is that optical technologies are not uh, uh, are not affected by the limitations of CMOS uh, scaling, so they are most more likely to give us this sort of natural um, exponential growth with new technology advances. But how can we switch packets using light? I will show you an animation in a, in a couple of minutes that basically shows that we have two main components that we want to use here. Um, and the idea, it's a very basic, simple idea, is that basically for every destination rack that we want to reach, we use a respective wavelength in the optical spectrum, so basically a color. So let's say I want to send um, a packet to the red rack, then I send it in the red uh, wavelengths, green in the green wavelengths, etc. Now do this by using this optical switch that we call, so I start the video now, the so-called array waveguide grating router, so this is a kind of conceptual, um, and white light is broken into respective um, uh, wavelengths, and you see red is, is directed to a specific port, green is directed to a specific port, and that it's basically a passive component, it's, it's grating on glass, like a prism um, technology, that uses one respective wavelength for each um, rack in the data center. And you hear, here you see this sort of how, how we realize it on our um, photonic integrated circuit. So that's my optical switch, the array waveguide grating router, AWGR. And here you see another component, and that's a tunable laser, because of course what we now need 
is um, a laser that doesn't give us white light, but that uh, gives us the respective wavelength so that we can encode our packet in the respective color, send it to our optical switch, and then have it routed automatically to the um, receiving um, rack. So um, a few years ago, we started to look at this tunable laser technology. And we started, of course, with commodity off-the-shelf tunable lasers that you can buy uh, at your supplier. So we found that tuning the laser between one wavelength and another took one millisecond. Well, people who know about networking know this is a lifetime in networking terms, so absolutely un unacceptable. What the team in Cambridge then uh, uh, did is take this sort of commodity off-the-shelf uh, la tunable laser, but um, kind of squeeze every bit of performance out of it that we can by integrating into this uh, board, by designing our own algorithm for tunability, etc. cetera. Here's uh, um, one of the prototypes we produced. And we were able to reduce um, the, the switching time by four orders of magnitude to 100 nanosecond. Well, that sounds great. I mean, that's an amazing achievement, right? If you kind of look at the research um, achievements that have been made. But let's have a, have a look at you know, a specific example. So let's say we want to s uh, send a packet, 256 byte packet, to the red rack. And we want to send um, another packet to the green rack uh, straight afterwards. What would happen now um, is that basically because of the switching time, I have this delay of 100 nanoseconds in between. I just have to wait before I can send the next packet, right? That means I have a link utilization of less than 30%, which is not acceptable. Again, the overhead is, is too big. So this didn't work. And that means um, uh, in, in MSR Cambridge, we decided to take a fundament, uh, fundamentally different approach and design our own um, photonic integrated circuit, our own PIC. And this is sort of what it's sketched today. You see here, of course, the device that you've seen earlier um, in the animation. So that's the, um, that's the uh, AWGR, the optical switch. And then on the left-hand side, you basically have lots of little lasers that produce their respective wavelengths. And you can, in principle, go up to hundreds of different wavelengths. So here is the size of a pick in comparison to a point, pound coin. And here's basically what happened. So let's assume you're looking back at red and green packets. So my, um, the one side of this chip then uh, creates all these different wavelengths. And the, others, uh, the other side is basically like a wavelength filter. So what we see here is that when, this, when the filter is on green, it only lets through the green wavelengths. If we tune it on red, it only lets through the red wavelengths. And in this way, I can, in principle, use hundreds of different wavelengths to, uh, to reach every rack in my data center. So this is a, uh, a device that we, um, that we designed uh, in the Cambridge lab and that was then fabricated uh, um, in an external foundry. So now let's look back at our performance, our switching performance, as mentioned before. So how fast can we now switch our tunable laser? Well, it's less than one nanosecond, which is amazing because if we look at our example, then our switching time is almost negligible and I, I reach almost um, full link utilization. So we talked about rack to rack, so let's have a quick look at how that would work uh, uh, with between racks in the, across the whole data center. So basically, at the top of each rack, we now have our tunable laser that produces, uh, creates a packet in the respective wavelengths, depending on where the packet is going. We don't need pluggable transceivers, and we don't need this complicated hierarchy of electrical switches. We just convert in the rack our uh, signal into the optical domain, and then send it across our passive component, about, uh, across our AWGR where it is routed depending on wavelengths uh, to the destination rack. So now we have the effect that we have optical technology um, 
that is not affected by uh, by, by CMOS uh, by the end of Moore's law, and we can hopefully keep a, a flat cost factor there. And what we also achieve, and there's of course, I mean, it's a fundamentally new approach to networking, so there is a lot of consequences this has on what's happening today, of course. But if you kind of consider it, at the moment you send packets and you you uh, have to buffer them, um, and there is congestion, etc. That's of course a big problem in data center networks. Whereas now what we are saying is that we send a packet from one rack to another basically at the speed of light, so we know exactly how long the packet will uh, take, in this case 250 nanoseconds, um, in order to get to the destination rack, and that depends on the length of the, um, of, of the distance, on, on the distance between the racks. So we basically now have a deterministic approach, so we know exactly how long it will take, and that uh, um, is, is for um, applications in HPC, for example, this of course uh, is a great opportunity because uh, we can rely on this and don't have to uh, plan in um, arbitrary times of packet processing and buffering. Um, but just to say, so there are, of course, it's a fundamentally new approach, so um, there are lots of technical challenges. Um, and we have, so we started this project, well, probably even further than that, but about in 2016, we developed this sort of uh, our own version of the, um, of the board with a custom uh, tunable laser. Um, and our own uh, AWGR component, that was sort of last year. Then there's another big problem now because we don't have buffers. We need to synchronize clocks very uh, exactly between the different racks of the data center. So we've been able to make impressive advances there last year. Um, and the team is basically now very confident that we can overcome these uh, very uh, difficult problems and one day use optical networks and data center. But just to make clear, this is a very long-term view in order to develop such a technology so that it can run at scale and um, st stable and within certain cost factors in the data center, that's of course a huge leap. Um, so that will take years to get there. But uh, yeah, I mean, a few years ago, we didn't kind of think that we would uh, solve these important problems and they have been solved. So there is a lot of optimism with this networking work to go further. Okay, so that was the uh, project introduction to our work in optical networking. Um, and what I will show you next is uh, the work we do in optical storage. And just to say, so with this storage, um, we're looking at so-called cold or frozen data. So this is archival data that is accessed very infrequently or possibly never. Think about your uh, health insurance data from like 30 years ago. You can't throw it away, but you have to save it. Um, somewhere, and the idea here is to develop a storage media from the ground up specifically for the data center. So we were not sort of threw away everything that was that existed before and, and really looked from scratch what are the requirements in the data center and how can we meet it. So I, I brought a little glass sample here. It's basically, it's like three centimeters <coughs> or so. Um, and what you see there is what basically the data is enco encoded in these little blue dots. <coughs> and uh, that's encoded inside the bulk of the glass. There are, of course, other optical storage uh, media like DVDs, Blu-rays, etc. Uh, but they are surface technologies. Here, my data is encoded inside the bulk of the glass. And this is just the Azure logo. So going back to our data tsunami, right? Overall data generated growing exponentially. With the data tsunami, we, can, uh, we, we know that with existing storage technologies, the ratio of data we can afford to store goes down because the you know, existing technologies cannot keep up. I've got a couple of slides up there and I could sort of talk about this at great lengths, but um, <clears throat> the, the capacity is not uh, uh, high enough and the problem is that the lifetime is not, uh, is not high enough either. So this ratio goes down. And what we are trying with Project Silica <clears throat> is to push this uh, curve up so that we can afford to store more data or that we can store data for longer, depending on our workloads. 
So let's look at what we have today. Of course, Azure has offerings across all the different data storage requirements, and you talk about hot data to cold to frozen data. Um, so there are <coughs> uh, current great running um, Azure offerings. And on the right-hand side, you see the existing uh, technologies that are used. And some people might be surprised to hear that tape is still being used quite extensively in data centers. It's actually quite a good technology. The, the big problem with tape at the, is that the spooling takes a long time because these um, tapes can be like a kilometer long. So our silica project that sits down there with the cold to frozen data um, with the goal to basically eternally storage, uh, store your data and ideally not have to back it up again but eternal lifetime of the storage medium. So just very quickly, uh, what are the existing archival storage media? So this is um, a, a summary. On the left-hand side, we basically have the magnetic ones, hard disk and magnetic tape. And here the optical ones, optical disks like Blu-ray, DVDs. The problem is with all of these um, that there are surface technologies. So they suffer from things like, it's called bit rot, um, it's one thing, or ele electromagnetic pulses can affect the data, or just electrons leak out. So none of these to uh, uh, storage technologies, that these existing ones, lasts more than 10 years. The longest lifetime is for, uh, for magnetic tape, and that's 10-year lifetime. Um, my hard disk and my optical disk has a lower a lifetime. So if you think back at the one zettabyte, if I have the 100 million hard disks, but it takes me three years to copy the data onto my 100 million hard disks, and then at the end of that time, I need another three years to, uh, to back it up to new storage media, then effectively I might have only two or three years left where the data is actually stored before I have to revisit um, this. So that doesn't scale very well. So we took inspiration by this, and this is basically a clay, um, a, a bit of clay, a clay tablet uh, that's in the British Museum. It's 5,000 years old, and it's one of the oldest bits of data um, that we have. And of course, it's carving in the clay. So it's a physical change um, in the material. And that's basically the motivation for uh, us using, using silica glass. What we want to achieve is that we basically write the data into the storage media once and then leave it there forever. <clears throat> so we want uh, basically thousands of years li lifetime. And we don't want you know, these effects that we have with current media, we can't uh, accept it in our technology. And we, of course, need a cheap material as well. So there's lot, quite a lot of uh, um, requirements. And what we settled on is um, basically it's, it's silicon dioxide. It's just basically it's, it's, it's glass. It's like melted sand. So it's a very cheap material. Um, and I'll show you regarding robustness. We tested it. It's uh, one of our researchers doing some tests at home. quite an amateurish video, <laughs> of course, but yeah, that's our colleague, uh, uh, a physics scientist, uh, Ariel, who, who did these uh, tests. And indeed, we were able to read the data out uh, without a problem afterwards, because the data is stored inside the glass. <clears throat> so, and you might say, why is this possible now? Why was it not possible earlier? Well, it's because now we have the femtosecond laser technology. So it's a laser, basically, that pulses um, in approximately 100 femtosecond wavelength. And how much is a femtosecond? 10 to the power of minus 15 seconds. So very, very, very short. 
So um, the idea with this femtosecond laser is that you basically direct the, the laser beam through a lens inside the bulk of the silica glass. And what happens then is that a voxel is created. That's a three-dimensional um, little structure. And if we kind of look back to the time before the femtosecond laser, we had the picosecond laser. And what you see here on a larger, um, time, uh, on a larger uh, scale of 50 nanometers, you see that cracks form in the glass. So basically, it's sort of um, the, the wavelength is not, is not short enough. It's not a, uh, you can't read any data out of this. But with the femtosecond laser, and now we are looking at 10 uh, nanometers, we get really uh, <coughs> very well-defined voxels in our glass. And you saw earlier, I mean, there were just a number of probably 10 of these blocks of arrays of dots um, in, in this glass, which is not putting it to, to maximum capacity, but it's all very, very dense. And this has enabled us to, um, to design this uh, technology in Project Silica. So how do you store the data in glass? How, how is, are these voxels formed? So basically what happens is that depending on, on the pulse and the polarization of your laser beam, um, the uh, voxels have a certain volume, uh, a size, x, y, y, z direction, um, the volume, but they also have these sort of nano gratings inside the glass. So um, we're working with this with the University of Southampton, and there have been um, relevant findings in the early, no, early two, 2003, um, that basically you get these nano gratings within the voxel, so basically, you can say it's the 3D position of the voxel inside the glass, and then the size of the voxel and the orientation of the nano gratings, where, how, where we, how we encode um, the bits, basically. Okay. Um, and the one point I want to make, I will finish with an animation, but just one point to make. The good thing with this storage technology is that we can have the write, store, and read completely disaggregated. That means I have my write system somewhere and write my data in glass, then store it in a glass library, and then move it to the read system as and when I need it. With the, for example, with hard disks, you basically get the read and write heads as part of the, of the package. So here I can design it depending on how much read I need for my data. Okay, and I'll skip over those. Uh, there are just some schematic things about the write and the read process, but uh, they're basically summarized in this uh, animation that we've done that shows here the write process with my femtosecond laser burning these voxels, or not burning, it's sort of the stage beforehand, very small voxels into the bulk of the glass and in this way, we can form a 3D, three-dimensional array of vox voxels inside the glass and have lots of these little arrays on one glass, uh, little glass uh, square. And then once it's written, we put it in our glass library and then later on read it out um, with some kind of high-definition cameras. And basically what happens is we just take an image layer by layer in these arrays and go through top to bottom, take a picture of each of these layers, and then use computer vision techniques to read out the data. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my talk. To quickly summarize what I did, I talked about Azure, at, uh, about the amazing growth that Azure is undergoing, and um, how our uh, colleagues in the product group have, uh, have manage this growth, but I then also talked about the data tsunami and the problems with the end of Moore's law in compute networking and storage, and how we, with our optical technologies, hope to overcome those. And I um, introduced two specific projects in the space of networking and storage, and we have other projects going on. And um, you know, looking at how it's going now, we, we are very hopeful that these technologies one day will run into, in the data center. And just to point you to a few um, upcoming opportunities, and we have a website 
uh, around our theme of, of, of line of uh, research, optics for the cloud.com. So just go there and colleagues from HPC Group will be in uh, Frankfurt next week. Um, we also have an increasing presence in the physics and physics conferences and events with our work because of course we are very keen to um, get other physicists enthused about the, uh, applying their optics work in the data center. Okay, thank you very much. So many thanks, Scarlett, for this presentation, indeed about uh, beyond exascale. So you have seen things from femto, femto uh, meters up to two zettabytes. So for the sake of time, um, please, you know, this, if there's one or two short questions, now would be a good time to address them to, to Scarlett. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for your nice presentation. Um, you addressed how how to address a rack with the color, um, but what happens if several racks are talking to the same rack in the same color? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. There is actually one part of my presentation that will have uh, been about this, but I had to cut it out for um, for um, time reasons. So uh, this will require very careful uh, scheduling of packets uh, uh, inside the data center. So a really um, different approach because you can't just fire packets off and hope they arrive because they might interfere with each other. So you, you need a very, uh, you need sort of uh, an overall scheduling approach and that's why we have with the uh, um, with the time synchronization, why it has been very important for us to get to nanosecond sc uh, scale time synchronization so that we can make sure that we fire the packets off so that they don't interfere with each other. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so maybe you say it already, but how much uh, data can you store on one of these uh, little glass things, or how much you plan to store? Yeah. Um, that question always comes up. So there are some things I can't talk about for competitive reasons. But um, just one observation: we are, um, of course, doing this work in order to land in the data center. So the rates are competitive. Um, so if you look at the magnetic and other optics. Uh, uh, storage media, we have sort of very strict goals that we need to achieve and we are on track. So it's certainly a competitive uh, um, volume of data that we can store on there, but that's all I can say. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, one, one last short question. Mm -hmm. So going back to the um, optical switching, do you need to have a different wavelength of light for each uh, destination rack? And so what happens if, you know, you have a thousand different frequencies with a thousand different racks and all of a sudden you double your size of your data center? Do you need to re-encode everything and all of a sudden you need 2,000 different frequencies? Um, yeah, I mean, typically the data center is, of course, you have these well, small data centers and regions, etc. So they are a certain size and you'd rather build more data centers in the region so you can scale it uh, accordingly. But uh, for the number of racks that are on average there today and in the foreseeable future, um, we have enough wavelengths to cover those. But you would need, um, yeah, you, you, you do need to make, make sure to have enough uh, wavelengths to get to each one. And, but uh, the, the team is very comfortable that, um, that this is no problem. To cut here, because we have a 50, like less than 15 minutes quick coffee break, which is kindly sponsored by Microsoft. So we you know, refresh ourselves for the half hard uh, morning we're going to face. Uh, so thanks for showing up that early. And so Scarlett said you're around for a little longer. So yeah, like I will be here some of the uh, more questions can be addressed to her during the break. So see you in a bit. Thank you.